2 Samuel 9, verse number 3, the Bible says, And the king said, Is there yet any of the house of Saul that I may show kindness unto him? And Zippeus said unto the king, Jonathan has yet a son which is lame on his feet. Wait a second. There's still a son of Jonathan who is lame on his feet. The son's name we know is Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth's story can be told quickly, really in three words. When we look at this, we can call it Saul, Fall, and God. You have those three words? Saul, Fall, and God. He was of the house of Saul. And so Saul, let's look back. The grandfather of Mephibosheth. Uh, uh, his father was Jonathan. And so uh, uh, Saul was a king. And so here it is. Mephibosheth is born uh, uh, of a house of royalty. He is a prince. Yet because of his grandfather's disobedience, Mephibosheth would never know much about what it was like to live life in the palace. In fact, he would never know much about that. Because when he was five, five years old, his life would suddenly be changed. And he really wouldn't remember much about the palace. How many of you remember a lot of details about your life before the age of five? I do remember some things, and some things are vivid in my mind, but in great detail. I don't remember a lot of those years, just some really great highlights, even though they affect all of our lives greatly. And so for Granddaddy Saul, he was probably best known for his rebellious ways. Let's look at his life for a minute. So here it is, King Saul, this man who was socially backward, and he was, when you look at him, he was very socially backward, though he was head and shoulders above the rest, and he looked really good, he was still a backward young man. And uh, uh, when you look at the life of Saul, and you compare it to David, well, it's really much like their, their raising and what they did. What did, what did uh, David do? We know about him. He was a raiser of sheep. And, and so on the opposite side of the pendulum, there was Saul who was a raiser of donkeys. Sheep and donkey are very different than one another. And so you find that just as different and diverse as David and Saul were, as different and diverse as sheep and donkeys were, the, 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 the men very much have similarities in their life to what they had early in their life put their life to raising. And so here it was, Saul tended to be like his father's donkey. Uh, the donkeys, David, he had the nature of the sheep. Saul being a donkey, he, 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 always, he always kicked and, and fought against what was right. Whereas David, he was a man after God's own heart. He wanted to do what was right. And so Mephibosheth, he was born into a rebellious family, not by choice, but because what was given him. He was born into the house of a father. The Bible says that pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. We find that his granddaddy Saul and his daddy Jonathan perished. And so here it is that the destruction of Saul goes down to his three boys who's destroyed with him. Abinabab, uh, Machishia, and Jonathan are all killed. And the message is sent to the palace. And here is the nurse who grabs a hold of Mephibosheth, five years of age, and she drops him. And so he has a fall as well. In fact, the fall wouldn't be known. She drops him and she doesn't realize. But later in life, then it is found out that he's lame on his feet. His feet no longer work because of the fall that he had experienced because of the nurse who had had him. He becomes a product of the fall. Uh, uh, so, so the fall makes him a product of, uh, of where he's going. And then we find that, that, that he's a product of, of gall. What does gall mean? Gall means bitter. And he's raised in a place, low to bar which means there's no pasture, but it is a desert. It's not a place that most people want to live and be raised. He was once in a palace, and now he's being raised in a desert area. And so and he goes from, uh, uh, from, from, the, from, from the, uh, the fall to the gall, so to speak. So he's part of Paul, Saul to the fall to gall. Do you know that we live in a world of broken people? We live in a world 
full of broken people. Broken people all around about us. Do you ever notice that we're really, Sister Jan, I talked about Doc McStuff, and can I go back to our childhood? Let's all of us think about it. Our nursery rhymes even bring us to the place where we're conditioned to a world of fall around about us. What do I mean? Well, have you ever thought about Humpty Dumpty set on the wall and Humpty Dumpty had a great fall? We're conditioned to brokenness. Now, how many of you, you the, uh, uh, King Louis and, and Queen uh, Maria Antoinette, do you know that little rhyme that was wrote about them? Uh, Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. Jack fell down and broke his crown. So we're conditioned to a world of brokenness. Any of you ever seen that little uh, uh, melody rhyme? Uh, London Bridge is falling down. And so, uh, how about those three mice? There were three blind, blind, blind broken. And so we look at all that. We live in a broken world. And so here it is that, that David sends for Jonathan's son, uh, um, Mephibosheth. And the very first words that, 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 that Mephibosheth says is, don't look at me, I'm a dead dog. Read it. That's what the scripture says. That's how Jonathan, uh, uh, Jonathan's son responds to David. And so uh, the, uh, the, 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 the idea that I'm nothing but a dead dog. <coughs> you see, he's been conditioned for this situation that he's in. How many of you have noticed that in our world, tattoos are running rampant? Yes. Crazy, crazy, crazy. I'm not even going there. Crazy. Okay, but 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 Norman Vincent Peale. Forget about a lot of other things. Just listen to a story. Norman Vincent Peale sh shares a story that he was in Hong Kong and he went by a tattoo par parlor and he was noticing all kinds of things. There were ships. There were anchors. Uh, there were there were there were there were flowers. There were all kinds of things that that, that were there. And he noticed that that there was one that caught his eye. That there was a little tattoo that was there and it said, "Born." to lose. Ah. Lord Vincent Bill said to the tattoo artist, he walked in and he said, I need to ask you, I noticed the anchors, I noticed the flowers, I noticed all these others in his eyes, but there's one that catches my eye, born to lose. He said, do you really give tattoos to people that says born to lose? He said, unbelievably. He said, I do give them. And quite frequently. He said, uh, I just can't believe that anybody in their right mind would do that. And so in his broken Chinese English, he replied back to Norman Vincent Peale and he said, before tattoo on body, tattoo in mind. Born to lose, before tattoo is on body, tattoo is in mind. Some people are already conditioned that they are broken. Our, some people are already conditioned that they are going to, to, to lose. You see, before the outer mark ever is on the flesh, there is something that is grounded deep into the spirit that you are born to lose. Before the collars were ever arrayed on the skin, amen, the stigma was already appearing on the inside of that person. Before it shows who they are on the skin, it was already showing underneath the skin who they thought that they were, amen, the appearance may have changed their outward perception of what people look at them and see, but it had never changed what was already preconceived on the heart a long time ago. You see, before the prodigal ever leaves home, amen, there is a yearning and a desire inside to leave. Before there's ever a Demas that forsakes Paul, there's a desire that's in the heart that he's broken and he has a desire to do something that's contrary to God. What am I telling us this morning? That we live in a world full of broken broken people, both physically and emotionally and spiritually. However it is, broken physically. Amen. That, that, that brokenness of their body, the brokenness of who they are, the aging effect, the effects of sin, uh, the effects of things that's happened on them uh, because of bad decisions, effects in their spirit because of what people's poured into them and what they've allowed to come into them spiritually because they're broken without ever allowing God to fix them. We live in a broken society. And so before 
The tattoo is on the body. The tattoo is in the mind. A young man with the chef. I'm just using this as an illustration. Don't lose out with me because my illustration. What was already spoken by the chef? Don't look upon me. I'm a dead dog. It was already down deep in the chef's heart before it was ever spoken. Broken people. All the king's forces and all the king's men. We live in a world full of black, uh, uh, just immorality. And I'm just going to leave it there. But the only thing that they have is the relics of hope from a good life. From fondest wishes, good desires. Here is Mephibosheth, who was a prince who lived a pauper's life, a broken dream. It's just a memory. Could I say, that really resembles all of us this morning. Because without God, we're broken. All there is is a hope of peace. A hope of wholeness. A hope of good standing with God. A hope of a good life to be lived. And a hope of a better life in eternity. Amen. That's all it is without God. It's just a hope for us. And here it was with Mephibosheth. He said, I'm a dead dog. I'm not prince. That's long gone. I'm living in Lodabar. I'm living where there is desert. I have this tattooed upon my soul before I ever articulated it out of my mouth. Uh, from, from the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. I've already had it in my heart. Amen. I'm a dead dog. I'm not, I'm not a prince. My, 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 my granddaddy saw, well, he was a rebellious man. He was socially awkward. He didn't want to please and honor God. He took because of his rebellion. He died and my two uncles died and my daddy died and so uh, the nurse was running with me to save me but I became a product of the fall as well and now here I am lame on my feet I'll never walk again I don't live in a palace I live in this barren place I, I only have a hope of a dream I am broken I can't be fixed how many of us carry things in our life how many of us have things in our life where it's just a distant memory? We think that it used to be that way. I can never be that way again. I can't laugh again. I can't smile again. I can't have inner peace with it. I don't have a hope of it. What are things in our life that are broken? I'm telling you, we live in a, in a world full of broken people. But the message of the gospel is, is that God fixes broken things. He restores the hope that has long ago since been lost. And so here it is, amen, uh, we look and we see that sin, it destroys life. And so David, he really ran a hospital of broken dreams for a man named Mephibosheth. We, we, we dream of Doc McStuffins. Amen. The one who preaches uh, uh, the, the, the message, bring your broken toys and family relics and heirlooms to me and I'll fix them. I have all the, the stitching. I have all the extra parts of dolls and, and wonderful heirlooms. I can fix them. It becomes a reality spiritually with God. We entertain ourselves on those things. You see, David... He knew what it was like to run with the rowdy crowd. You see, when he was running for his life from Saul, he joined himself with a band of men who were broken men. Men who was out there that no one else wanted. They were has-beens. Their lives were over. And David said, I'm going to bring you men together and I'm going to rally you. And they became a great army for the kingdom of God. David knew that God could fix broken dreams. David knew that God could restore hope. And so here it was. He said, let, let, let me solidify the kingdom that was broken. And let me bring uh, uh, Jonathan's son to me. He was my friend and he was my mentor. And so I want to take that brokenness and I want to fix it. Can I tell you that the kindness of God, amen, is, is reflected in the kindness that David showed to Mephibosheth. We have a kind God. What are those things in our lives that we would love to see fixed? Amen. Their hopes long gone and we think that they can never be restored. But God says, bring the broken things to me and I will fix them. It was unbelievable for Mephibosheth because the king cares. Can I tell you that the king cares? He cares this morning. And he wants to fix. 
I love what Daniel chapter number nine says. I'm going to read it. David prays his prayer, or Daniel prays his prayer, and he says, Oh God, incline your ear and hear and open your eyes and see our desolations and the city which is, it is called by your name. For we do, not uh, do we, we do not present our supplications before you because of our own righteous deed, but because of your mercies. You know what? What are your broken, desolate areas in life? I'm not preaching to your neighbor. I'm preaching to you this morning. What are are those desolate areas of your life, amen, that you can bring to God and by His mercies, He can restore and renew and fix for you. What are those things? What are those things? See, can you imagine what it was like for, for Zibia, who's the servant of David? Let me just turn this down a little bit here. Can you imagine what it's like? Zibia, David comes and says, Can you tell me, Zibia, is there any of the house of Saul that is right? Zibia says, Wait a second, wait a second, I'm, I'm a little nervous. You see, because, you know, your son Absalom, there is one that's of the house of Saul, but he's not near as good looking as your son. And he is not near as, as full of zeal and life and energy as your son. I don't know, David. And, and you know, he's not like your son Solomon that has all this wisdom and his strength. You see, he's not, he's not smart to the ways of the palace. He, he, he doesn't have all the rough edges knocked off him. They're completely different. You see, but David said, I don't care. Who is he? Because of his work. I want to. Sometimes we try to measure up who we think we need to be in God's eyes. And we say, I can't do it. But God says, you don't need to measure up. I'll fix the broken things. I'll restore the things in your life that matters the most. You see, because David knew what it was like. Do you remember one day Saul came, uh, Samuel came by to anoint one of Jesse's sons? That's David's dad. And all the brethren came that was good looking and tall and all together. And Samuel said, no, it's none of these. Is there any? Oh, wait. There's a little short, ruddy boy. Red hair, freckles all over. There he is out taking care of, of the sheep. Bring him to me. They brought him to him. And this is the one. This is the one. David knew all about what it was like to be believed in by someone when no one else believes in you. Do you struggle with that this morning? Maybe you say, I don't believe anybody else believes in me. I don't believe anybody else has confidence in me. But can I tell you that David is a shadow of Jesus Christ and even greater than David is Jesus Christ who believes in you and knows what God's plan is for your life. And all those dreams and all those desolate areas God wants to bring hope back to it. Sister Holly, if you come to the piano. And so, the call was given, bring Mephibosheth to the king's table. And the word which are whispered in Mephibosheth's ear is that the king cares. See, I want you to know something this morning. There's a lot of people in life who just want some sympathy. Listen, God is not out to hand out sympathy, but God does hand out empathy. God knows what you feel this morning. You may say, but there's no hope in that area. It's a desolate area of my life. It's over. It's done. How can hope ever be restored? Amen. God is empathetic to that area. He says, what you think can't be restored, I can restore. Here it is. Do you remember what Jesus did when he got upset at the temple? He drove out the money changers. He was upset about what was happening there. He drove them out. And then we continue to read the blind and the lame could be restored. God is here to get rid of all the 
spiritual stuff, if you will, that we seem to cloud about. He said, all that stuff needs to go out the window so that there can be way, that way made for the brokenness that I can heal and I can be sure. Isaiah, he wrote, he said, by his stripes we are healed. God born stripes. So that our brokenness could be made whole. Isaiah went on to write, he said, Console those who mourn Zion. Give them beauty for ashes and the oil of joy for mourning and the garment of praise for heaviness. Amen. God loves the healer. He likes to exchange our hurt for healing. I like what Bill Gaither wrote. He wrote this. He said, something beautiful, something good. All my confusion, he understood. All I had to offer him was brokenness and strength. But he made something beautiful out of my life. I love the song that I heard growing up. Are you tired of chasing pretty, pretty rainbows? Are you tired of spinning round and round? Wrap up all the shattered dreams of your life and at the feet of Jesus, lay them down. Give them all, give them all to Jesus. Amen, give them all to Jesus. There is a hospital that Jesus has. My girls are amazed by Dr. McStuff and her hospital. Probably a lot of these children in this church are because she has a hospital fixing thing. There's some of you out there, you know about the medical world, be a part of that. How neat it is to see broken things restored, broken people. That hospital of broken things that started in Nepal, Italy, is still going on. But can I say this? In closing this morning, Jesus has a hospital of broken things. In his hospital, there's a woman. Her name is Mary Magdalene. Oh, so very broken. But God restored her. In the hospital, there's a man whose name is Peter, who God has restored. There's a man whose name is Saul Tarsus. There's a man whose name is John Mark. Amen. All of who God fixed. The list goes on and on. And I would dare say that many of our names are on there. And I believe the story, some names can be added. Because God is the fixture of our country. Do you hear me this morning? God is the fixer of broken dreams. You may say, Brother Seville, that heirloom, that cherished thing, I've done laid that broken piece aside a long time ago. This morning, would you bring it to Jesus? He knows how to fix it. He knows how to restore it. Jesus Christ has a hospital of broken things that he fixes. Would you bring every broken, every broken, every broken dream to Jesus this morning? Would someone say this morning, Pastor, that's me. I bring the broken thing to Jesus. If that's you, would you gather around this all this morning and say, here I come with my broken thing. Let's gather around this morning, would you? Would you bring your broken things to Jesus? You may say nothing but a dead dog and the fellowship thought that. That was already tattooed upon his heart long before it was articulated with his words. But God said, I sent David. And David said something different than that dog. David sees her right You may say, I've been affected by the fall. Amen. Sin 
and the effects of sin has wrecked in her own my life. God says, but my mercy and my grace is greater. I can restore. Most people are not looking for the new, but most people are looking for the old to be renewed and restored. Allow him to do that this morning. Amen.